Year's event celebrates the festival's 19th year of provoking, inspiring and informing people from all ages and every walk of life to engage in spirited debate. And today um, there will be an opportunity for question and answers and a, a, a discussion from the floor as well with our excellent panellists. And I am absolutely de delighted um, with the help of the University of Glasgow, who are co-sponsors for this event, to welcome to um, the stage this morning, Stuart Casimir. <coughs> He's a BAFTA-nominated director. His films include BBC Scotland's Black and Scottish. And Stuart set up Create Anything, which is the first BAME production company in Scotland. Um, we have Linda Grimes Douglas, who's STV's Head of News and Current Affairs, with responsibility for operations in broadcast and digital across five local newsrooms in Scotland. We have uh, Luke McCulloch to my left, who's the Head of Corporate Affairs and Public Policy for the BBC in Scotland. And also Professor Philip Schlesinger, who's Professor of Cultural Theory at the Centre for Cultural Policy Research at the University of Glasgow and Deputy Director of CREATE, E, <laughs> literally, the um, UK Copyright and Creative Economy Centre. And a very warm welcome to you all this morning. Um, so, so our topic is the future of broadcasting and obviously broadcasting has changed, um, our habits have changed, the nature of broadcasting, public sector broadcasting has changed and each of the panel has, has a unique um, uh, experience and view of this and I'm, I'm going to open up by just asking them to outline what they think are the immediate um, challenges and the long-term challenges facing broadcasting uh, and um, I'll, I'll, I'll go right to left and, and, and ask Linda to come in first, please. Oh, well, hello everyone. That's a big question, isn't it? What are the, the challenges facing broadcasting? There are so many, but that's not a new question. When I first uh, joined STV, it was almost 30 years ago. I can't believe it as I say that out loud. And I think the first time I was actually told, I, worked, I started working in news. I came in as what was called a news assistant and the head of news said to me then, you know, broadcasting is not a job for life. It's changing, it's evolving. And I said, I understand that. I just need a job, I want to get in there. And I got in there. And I see the same thing, it's evolving and it's changing, but I've never really experienced such dramatic change, I would say, in the past 10 years. Driven, of course, as I'm sure all of you are very well aware of the whole world of digital. It, has, it is changing everything certainly that my newsroom is doing and it's certainly been driven by change and consumption by all of you and all of us here because we're all the consumers audiences are changing technology has driven that even coming over here today on on the train people were consuming on phones laptops um, ipads people expect news delivered to them so that's one of the big big challenges that i see in news and just in a, in, in a wider, a wider scale, of course, it's the introduction of the big streamers. Streamers bring choice. It's fantastic. Who doesn't love to sit and binge? I know I do. Stuart's nodding along here too. Uh, we love to binge, but that's a challenge also for public service broadcasting because public service broadcasters are the main channels. It's BBC, STV, ITV, Channel 4, Channel 5. And competition is good. I don't think anyone denies that. The question and where I would land on this is, is the world a better place with the existence of the streamers and public service media? And that's where I come at it. I think public service broadcasting is hugely important. It's important for many reasons, and I'm sure we'll get into that during the discussion. It's important it's where, where we see ourselves reflected, both in high quality drama and strong scheduling, but the cornerstone is News and Current Affairs, which I oversee. And it's a better place that we have it in any democracy. Big, big challenges ahead, Claire. Thank you. Stuart. OK, so when I was thinking about this, I was thinking, let me just be honest. In my view, as an exec producer for Create Anything, so we, we have produced content for BBC Scotland, but most recently, Amazon Prime. Um, a document, drama documentary, and also Four Kings, which is a sports documentary. Now, the difference I have noticed is when working with the BBC, the stringent X amount per 
hour, etc. We're going to be on the BBC iPlayer, which is nationwide, and then and then you've got Amazon Prime, which is basically okay, Stuart. We want you to direct this, produce this. How much do you want? And you're just looking at the figures you're getting from Amazon Prime and then the BBC. But with Amazon Prime, what you get is an international stage, which means for me as a director, I can go, I should be able to go anywhere in the world and I'll be able to say, you can just go and check out Amazon or Netflix, let's say. Now, um, what I've noticed is, I'm very fortunate I've recently signed up with a, a global um, production company and they said to me, as soon as we sign up, forget about the BBC and forget about Channel 4, it's all about making content for NBC, HBO, etc. So it's a bit sad because in Scotland we don't have the budget, the budgets are very, very small. You can tell a Scottish production um, straight away from speaking to Tim Davies at the time, head of, head of um, the BBC, he'd said with the budget, I come from a cinematography background, so aesthetically it looked like something from HBO, but it was, it was with um, a smaller budget. And he said that is the problem in Scotland. Scotland has got some beautiful stories, gorgeous stories, but aesthetically we know that you guys are you're on Netflix, you're on Amazon, you're watching good quality content. It looks good, it sounds good, it is good. The problem with Scotland is we don't have the money backing us to be able to create that content. So good DPs, good directors, good execs, etc., are all leaving um, to go work um, abroad. Now I have a family in, in uh, Glasgow, I'm here. However, I was offered to go and work in the Bob Marley um, film for Paramount Pictures in Jamaica for two months. And then it was in the States to work in a different strokes in the Janet Jackson documentary. Now, if I didn't have family, I wouldn't be here. I would, let, I would live elsewhere. And that is basically what's happening to all of the talent, really good talent, because why would they stay here if they don't have um, the platform? I could go on all day, so I'm gonna stop. But that's my, that's my take on it. And there's more. Thank you. Really interesting. I'm sure we'll come back to, 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 to those issues. Luke, would you like to come next? I, I think it's sort of morning, everyone, and apologies for being the one that came with the summer cold. Uh, absolutely inevitable that, that one of us would be. I think when you call an event the future of broadcasting, there's a sort of hint that it's maybe in trouble, that it's in crisis, that the future is uncertain. The future's always been uncertain ever since the, the BBC was founded, broadcast for the first time in Scotland 100 years ago this year. Uh, but it sort of troubles me sometimes that we paint the, these, these amazing things that the streaming platforms are doing as in being direct competition with the public part of broadcasting. And, and I don't see the future as, as them being in competition at all. I, I think they are different things doing different jobs for different people. The, the BBC in Scotland, obviously, is, it, it does, uh, as, as Linda said, have, have a news and current affairs team like STV does. It scrutinises the exercise of power in Scotland. It, it holds our politicians to account on, on radio, television and online uh, and has 14 different bases all across Scotland where we gather news and make sure that, that we're not just representing a part of Scotland, but that with one third of the UK's landmass, we can truly gather our news from everywhere where it's happening. But I think what a public broadcaster does is broader than news and current affairs. Uh, Gaelic is deeply important to the BBC in Scotland. We have our BBC Alibis service and also BBC Radio Nagail. Uh, and, and not only is that for, for speakers of Gaelic, but it's for learners of Gaelic and making sure that Scotland's language that isn't English also thrives in the same way that, that English does. Uh, the BBC invests in apprentices and skills. It's interesting hearing what Stuart's saying about talent fleeing Scotland, and I think money talks, and, and I get that. Uh, but the, the number of apprentices has changed exponentially, both in the BBC and at other broadcast operators in Scotland in the last few years. And there's so much so there's almost now a, a skill shortage, because it's not only the BBC and STV productions that are 
making video content in Scotland. It is Amazon Prime and it's uh, the Outlander production at Cumbernauld and so on. We have a, a really important job as public broadcasters to make sure we are helping train the industry and get the skills that are required in Scotland for us to be a home of creativity, which we've always been. But video production has been booming in Scotland in recent years, but, but a skill shortage could, of course, cause that, that to be a problem. But, but to that, do, do the streamers and, and the public broadcasters compete? I genuinely don't think they're the same thing. I think Netflix does a great job at what it does, but it doesn't really represent my life. And that, I think, is the job of the public broadcasters. I mean, unless your life is a castle for Christmas, that's their version of Scotland. It's sort of the tartan, the shortbread. It's not my version of Scotland. It's, it's not real life. I think that's what the public broadcasters, STV and the BBC, can do in a way that the streamers can't. Uh, they don't have, if you look back to the pandemic, for example, which is, is only really a short distance ago in terms of all of our memories, getting health information from both the Scottish government and the UK government to the audience. You didn't get that from Amazon Prime. When all of the schools closed, then the BBC had a bespoke curriculum offer for children that either didn't have internet access at home because of where they lived or because of the fact their families couldn't afford it. So free on television, bespoke to Scotland's curriculum, were hours and hours and hours of educational content. And we still provide, of course, the bite-sized service now that, that education has returned much more to normal. Also, when places of worship were closed, the BBC went into churches, to mosques, to synagogues, and filmed service material again so communities of faith could come together. Disney Plus probably wasn't doing that. They're different things, and I think they both have a future that's relevant, provided we get that future right. Thank you. And uh, Philip, final reflections? <laughs> yes. Uh, really uh, difficult, in a way, to summarise the, the current situation, but I think we are witnessing the end of broadcasting. In a way, we're, we're looking at a, a system where viewing scheduled TV is diminishing, um, there's a whole generational change going on in terms of how consumption is going, which is actually extending across generations, but particularly marked amongst younger generations. And um, we have heard really about the tensions around the finance of broadcasting. And I think that really is to get to one of the most fundamental things, because it is both an economic question, uh, but it's also very much a political question. And if you look over the past decade or so, you see um, the government, the UK government, um, having pushed back uh, the funding available to uh, the BBC and the other broadcasters uh, redefining what they do. Uh, so that if you look, for example, at the way in which ITV and STV have developed, they're not exiting from traditional broadcasting, but they're changing the way their businesses operate so that they are much less dependent on providing broadcasting. Um, I think one of the things that Stuart said uh, really points to the changing marketplace, which is driving the situation we're in now, uh, which is partly due to technological change, but also due to sheer money that can be spent on the making of content. Um, Netflix will spend four times as much on a drama as the BBC can afford. So one of the fundamental questions, and I, I think this really touches on a, a point made by Luke, is what do we want? Do we want something that is in the public interest? Do we want something that is not purely driven by commercial considerations. And we've reached a point where that's actually quite difficult to decide. Uh, it's difficult to decide for many reasons, but one of the reasons is that generations have now grown up without a sense of what public service broadcasting is. Um, it's not a criticism, it's simply a fact. The, the whole map that we have of the media ecology, the, the way in which uh, media companies operate, has transformed in the last decade. Uh, so um, you need to kind of get out there and explain to people why we want something that's public, something that supports 
the variety of cultural and other identities in the UK. It's quite true that these are not the remits of the big streamers. Uh, they are the remit of public service broadcasters. Do these things matter? Does, uh, if you like, honest journalism, uh, which is based on a principle of uh, evidence and impartiality matter to us? Uh, that's very much in question at the present time uh, in a society that's highly divided. Now, all of these are the, the, the currents that are running through the debate about broadcasting. Um, you know, th th there's a plethora of stuff that you could read if you really wanted to, but the fundamental questions are how is what is left of the public system going to redefine itself how is it going to be funded? Is it going to get the kind of political support that it needs? And above all, is it going to get the public support that it needs? Are people prepared to pay for it? Um, at a time when we, we subscribe to everything, if you like, or actually at a time of economic crisis when a lot of us desubscribe from things, uh, how do you actually persuade people that these are public goods they're not just for me, uh, but they're for us. Um, so th there's, there's, a, there's a big, big dilemma uh, in our political and cultural life uh, which has not yet been resolved in a context of massive hostility, I would say, from the Conservative Party towards public service broadcasting over a long period. Uh, I, I could go on, of course, uh, since I've spent years going on about things, but I will just stop there and uh, say that's my agenda. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I wonder um, if I could just um, bring a, a sort of Scottish focus on some of the comments that have been made. Um, over the years, we've had discussions in Scotland about uh, the nature of public sector broadcasting at one point. Um, We've got fantastic studios, both for STV and BBC in Glasgow. Um, but there was a concern at one point that some of the production wasn't, if you like, Scottish grown, that it was um, brought in and put in Glasgow. But the, the writing, the techniques, the, the um, IP of all of that wasn't really a, a Scottish brand. And you mentioned that particularly we're not reflecting Scotland. But I was particularly interested in, in Stuart's comments as well um, in that, the opportunities you have now are fantastic and are on the back of incredible work that you've done. But do you think that would have been possible without the public sector broadcasters that we have in Scotland at the moment and the opportunities within Scotland? And, and, and what, what in terms of, you know, um, reflecting yourself, Linda, um, I mean, what, what does that production here actually do for that skill set and growing it because we're always been told it's a huge opportunity for Scotland so I'd like to hear just you know how we how we capitalize on that and what's needed from government to make that happen so if I go to Stuart first is you, okay you, mm -hmm. um I sounded really brutal at the start there and I feel really bad because because my first documentary was commissioned by um BBC Scotland. So literally, I would not have a career if it wasn't for BBC Scotland. Documentary called Black and Scottish. We were nominated for two BAFTAs and then from there. So if it wasn't for BBC Scotland, I wouldn't be sitting here. So I just want to put that out there. I want the best for Scotland and, um, going forward. I was very fortunate to work on Anansi Boys for Amazon Prime, a Neil Gaiman um, film. It was shot in Leith. I worked on that for three, four months. And I helped provide um, BAME talent, BAME crew for that uh, production. And I did see, you know, people travelling from London to come, and, to come and work here. Yes, they were trying their best to, to, to use um, Scottish talent. One of the directors, um, Douglas McKinnon, he was a great director, um, one of the, uh, directed the line of duty. But one thing that always baffles me is if you, you've got movies like Batman, right, and they come over and they lock down the city centre. Um, and the, the, What am I trying to say? The, the amount of money behind it and the way that it looks, it's just, it's got that American look and feel in an American movie. I would love to see 
Glasgow shut down like that, but it's a Scottish production company. How could that be if it was pe people from Scotland rather than us going, oh my God, the Americans are here, look, they're you know. How could it be if it was a Scottish production company locking down, or how could it be if it was a Scottish production company locking streets down in New York, you see? But um, I think, I think that it's, it's a hard one because it's about, it is about skill set and, and, and the production, and the BBC, for example, the Scottish um, networks can put a lot more, should put a lot more money um, for the production companies in Scotland to be able to do things like that because the networks, sorry, the streamers aren't going to come to Scotland and go, I just want a predominantly Sc Scottish um, team and I want to predominantly make a Scottish film. I can say that there's a film called Loch Ness that, that's getting worked on a big, uh, there you go, a film called Loch Ness getting worked on and a big American production. It's Americans that are making it. So I can't really answer your question. All I can say is that we do need to put a bit more money into um, Scottish talent um, and try and diverse, also diversify um, our productions. So I don't know if I've made any sense there, but one, yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. A, lot, a lot of sense, like really, really interesting. Yeah. I think particularly a number of things resonate with me. One about building careers mm -hmm. and building futures for people, that people can stay in Scotland and work in Scotland and enjoy careers as directors and producers on a world stage. That has to be an ambition. Um, the work has to be there. It's as simple as that. For STV, I mean, I, I hear as head of news, but actually STV is part of that diversification strategy. It's about growing the business. And there is no reason why STV Studios, which is a production arm of the company, which is set to quadruple revenues uh, next year, can't be making big films and big productions for the global streamers. And they can be, they can be here in Scotland, and they can be further afield. And there's been a commission for uh, <coughs> Apple TV, I think it is, it's Peter Capaldi, Criminal Records. We've got a fantastic head of drama, Sarah Brown, who has brought, it was commissions actually for Channel 4, which was Screw, which was filmed at the Kelvin Hall in Glasgow. That's in its second series. Fantastic returning series. Um, many of the people who came in and worked in Screw were trainees. Uh, we had a part of part of the, the trainee programme was actually for ex-offenders. It's about bringing people into the business who have not been in the business before. Far too often to get a job in television, you had to know someone, you had to be in the right place at the right time. Well, that's luck, that still happens. But you had to know someone, that should not be the case. So I think we're not as big as the BBC in terms of our wider training programmes, but there's a conscious effort to ensure that the door is open to others and that when people come in, there is a responsibility when they're in STV, on it, it may be short term contracts, but that we can work together with other producers so that we can build a base of skilled people that don't frankly have to leave Scotland and head to London to continue with their jobs. Um, what I would also say in just that diversification strategy, other like returning series we've got coming back at STV. Uh, we've got catchphrase, I know it doesn't, might not set everyone here alight, but people watch it, it's great, isn't it? Do you watch it? Yeah, my, my um, kids you... watch it as well. Oh, Do good, it? yeah. <laughs> good. Um, isn't it great to know because we're still watching TV yeah. too? We maybe go into that point. The wider point being, it, it really resonates with me what you say about you know, building that production base. That's out with news. I've been very fortunate in terms of news. If you go into news in Scotland and you stick in at it and you work hard, there's still, you know, brilliant careers within news and I was fortunate. It wasn't how I planned my life. 30 years on, I'm head of news. Uh, but it's important for me to be here today to say, you know, encourage those in the audience who want to come into the industry, but it is incumbent upon those who, who uh, make the decisions and support the industry that the right decisions are being taken. Okay. Um, Philip, do you want to reflect on the policy side of how we grow grow this industry, maintain this industry and the, the sort of skills aspect yes, of it? I, well, I, I, do, I do think there's been a major change in Scotland, you know, having studios which 30 years ago were being discussed but no action was taken uh, is, is, is a big plus. Um, I think um, there is a talent base. Um, it is better supported. Uh, the, the arguments in Scotland uh, in relation to funding are always um, 
we need our share, a proportionate share of what's spent within the UK. And I think that argument will never go away. But I think the, there have been big changes. And I, I would say that um, if you look at uh, the way in which uh, Salford Keys has become, uh, if you like, the second production centre in the UK, uh, at a time when Scotland actually did occupy that position, and in terms of the regional politics of the UK, this has been hugely significant, and I don't think uh, Scotland has recovered its position by any means um, since that happened. So I think, um, you know, where we're, where we're getting at in this discussion, I think, is that we're talking about the way in which global markets are affecting what goes on in the UK. Uh, they're affecting careers, they're affecting budgets, uh, they're affecting ambitions. And then within the UK itself, uh, there are changes going on. The so-called levelling up is not actually working. Um, in fact, there are many reasons to think that levelling down is, con is continuing. So what happens in the creative sector is far from immune uh, from what happens within the economy as a whole. So I think, um, you know, I, it, this is not sounding... Uh, a kind of uh, a doomful song, you know, it's, it's not like that, it's, it's better than it was, but it's all about relative positions, and the relative position is not great in Scotland, in my candid view, you know, and I, I think actually that the, the eye has been taken off the ball, there really has not been enough, I mean, it, it, you know, within the devolved settlement that Scotland has, uh, Scotland does control its cultural policy, and I don't think there's been enough discussion about how that might be used perhaps more effectively, even given the fact that uh, broadcasting is um, a reserved matter, that is you, something that belongs to the UK government rather than to the Scottish government. And, you know, there have to be ways around this, and particularly in a changing marketplace, it can't all rest on what's done in the public sector. It, you know, there have to be ways of devising um, Attract, the attraction of, of new business which, which circumvent the kind of constraints that we've had for decades now. Uh, Luke, um, you, you, you mentioned specifically um, the, the, some of the programmes not reflecting what you see as Scotland and obviously um, uh, the BBC um, has one of the, the most important roles as a public sector broadcaster um, with regards to commissioning. I just wondered if you could reflect a bit more on that and, and maybe say a bit about um, the uniqueness of BBC Alipa and the Commission of Gaelic and Scots Language and other programmes and, and what difference that makes to, to what you see as the cultural landscape of broadcasting. Let me take that in two parts and, and tie that back to what you were saying originally about when studios first opened, what content was being made there. And I think success breeds success. Scotland was able to show very quickly it was a great place to make television, but there were only a couple of studio facilities, both inside the BBC's building at Pacific Quay. And now, thankfully, we have, through, through other public investment and private investment, a much bigger studio landscape in Scotland. And what it turns out we are particularly great at making is the kind of shiny floor show entertainment programs, so things like the hit list, eggheads, that sort of stuff. The, the skills in Scotland are, are very, very uh, good for making that, and many, many of these sort of entertainment programs are now made here. But you wouldn't necessarily know that. It doesn't necessarily reflect our life. But I wouldn't argue against it. It's great for jobs, it's great for people developing their skills, uh, and, and why wouldn't we want them here? If, it, if, if people are wanting to come and make television here, yeah, bring them in, I, I, I'm all for that. I think there's been a, a, a real sort of ballooning, though, in, in drama in recent times that does reflect our lives. I'm thinking of things like Shetland, which is now ab about to return for its seventh or eighth series with a brand new lead character, in fact, when it next comes on, which I'm really looking forward to. Uh, I, I know some people will be tutting at the lack of Douglas Henshaw in the room, but g give it a chance. See, see what it looks like when the new series starts. There's River City. 
which has now been on air for 20 years as a, as, as a drama, reaching parts of our audience that our other drama doesn't reach and is a really valued, important part of the TV landscape for people in Scotland. There were dramas like Vigil set on uh, the, the submarine. I don't know if anyone saw that. Uh, slightly odd references to the Procurator Fiscal Service and so on, but generally quite reflective of, of, of how that part of Scotland works. There was The Cry with Jenna Coleman, the, the story about the, the sort of car accident and other bits and pieces there. Or, or there was the sort of heartwarming and heart-rending Mayflies, uh, which, which is a fabulous bit of, of content. And if you haven't seen it, see that. Granite Harbour, uh, which ran just a few months ago, reflecting the northeast of Scotland to the world. And as someone who was on air on North Sound Radio in Aberdeen for a long time, it was just fabulous to see parts of the Granite City literally reflecting itself on TV screens all around the United Kingdom, on iPlayer and beyond. Uh, and then in Gaelic, obviously money is really, really tight, but it doesn't mean it, it can't have those big cultural interventions as well. Uh, on Radio Nagale, there's some, some drama running at the moment trying to commission new writers in Gaelic, which again, nobody else would be doing without public investment. But, but there has also been drama on our BBC Alibis service. Uh, the, this, uh, the most famous one is probably Bannon, uh, which was made by Chris Young, an independent filmmaker. Uh, Chris made The Inbetweeners for Channel 4, but Chris's view was not only did he want to make a Gaelic drama, he wanted to make it in Sky, where he grew up. So he moved his production company there, hired local actors, local filmmakers, and brought his Channel 4 filmmaking skills into Sky and has exported that to other places around the world where they have, for want of a better way of putting it, minority language television services. So Bannon has been sold into a Breton TV service in France, as far as I know, uh, and, and it's also been sold into Germany and so on. So we, we are taking uh, items that reflect Gallic culture and taking them to, to our European friends, which I think is, again, only possible with that public investment. I, I, I think Gallic would be in a really precarious position without the investment of public media keeping it alive. I, spoke for a while to the people who run the Gallic Medium Education School in Aberdeen. It's a really thriving primary school, but in the wider community, Gallic is hardly spoken at all. And if it wasn't for BBC Alaba, these children would have really no community exposure to the language that they're learning in. So again, without that public intervention, where would that be? Thank you. Um, if, I'm going to ask one more question and then we'll maybe move to some contributions from the audience, but um, the other um, change in our habits, if you like, it was a time when we all were watching the same four channels of an evening. Those days are long gone, but we still have the opportunities for um, big consumer um, experiences, um, festivals, the cycling competitions that are on across um, the UCI, and um, being across Scotland at the moment, really, really, really important. And other things like the coronation that I, I, I significant historical events and I just wanted to, to re ask if you, you felt that people felt differently about those experiences now has our, our, our attitude to those kind of um, events changed or, or is there still a place do you think there will always be a place for um, a public sector broadcaster and news streamer or whatever to cover these events to the extent they were. I know, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll come to you, Linda, first um, on that. Interesting question. It's a question that we could all answer. Are you, do, we, do we sit about talking about the TV programme that we watched last night, which we used to do all the time? You'd go into uni or work or school and did you watch this, did you watch this, did you watch this? Now it is more fragmented. Um, that said, people have, you know, we spoke about digitalisation. People have got their own communities in a way that you might go and look online and try and figure out, I mean, I know I did it when, when it was um, line of duty, you know, who was X? I, I was, I have to find this information out. And you had to wait until the Sunday night. So from a scheduling point of view, that was great scheduling, I, I, I would suggest. Um, and we all, as, as a kind of TV watching community, you know, built towards those moments. I and mean, you still get that. It's just, it is just changing now. In terms of news, uh, I think that in the past year, we have some incredible moments. We have had a changing of a monarch and only public service media would have covered that event uh, at the scale and the depth and the breadth that, that, that happened. And that was years and years in the planning. And I know, look, you'll have colleagues that will have spent their entire careers, decades. you know, decades, decades writing. Now, 
you know, you, you, you can argue the toss around the, the, the amount of time spent on it, but as a piece of history, which it was, and the commitment and investment that went into it, I argue they are hugely, hugely important moments. On another scale and on a personal scale, Glastonbury was fantastic. It was a joyous occasion. It was wonderful. And it was, I was delighted to see that the BBC were there and they were broadcasting it in all their different platforms. Fantastic moments. Public service media will do that. Big streamers won't. So that's what's really important. And from where I sit in news, news attracts the biggest audiences night after night. Last Friday night, 39% of people in Scotland were watching STV News at six. 39%. That's big. That's not a coincidence. It's because the news that we produce is relevant. It's reflecting people's lives. It's reflecting what goes on at Parliament, not just this Parliament, the Parliament's at Westminster. It reflects what's going on in our hospitals, in our schools. It's holding people to account. It's reflecting sport and it's reflecting what we're also laughing at during the day, our lovely Anne Finleys. So it's no coincidence that people tune in for strong, high quality news and that's what public service media does and it needs to be protected. Claire, I've got quite pointy heady there. I think what you really wanted to know is, do we miss those big moments? Yes, you know, I think schedulers have to work hard. They've got to get creative. That's why you have commissions on, you know, turnaround programmes, um, you know, the Bake Off, people tune in, they invest in it, the reality TV, it might be for some of you in this room. I know Claire, we spoke before and I, I, I revealed I was a fan of Big Brother, not so much of Love Island. Love Island attracts the viewers. People want to see that. That's the moments that people will talk about. So a whole gamut there for us to, to choose from. They are being produced by the, the broadcasters in the nations. Philip, have you any reflections on <laughs> Yeah, so, well, I, I do think the, you know, what Linda was talking about there really does matter. That some of the very big moments, um, you know, are still common moments, but the, bit, the major change that's happened is that there are relatively few moments that are common moments. Um, and that's for a whole plethora of reasons. You know, one is we actually live in a very divided society and I think one of the aspirations for public service broadcasting is it's going to heal uh, the divisions of the society. And I think, you know, I think the tenor of our discussion so far is that it's less and less able to do that. Uh, it's certainly true that 39% um, of people were watching STV news, but who are those people? You know, it, it's, it's not the young, youngest generations. It, who's actually being addressed? You know, I think you have to look at how consumption has changed, uh, whether people go to linear TV, whether they go online, whether they get it from a social media source, you know, these all matter. The, 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 the ways in which we consume matter because it's not the basis of a common conversation, actually, if we, um, if we consume diversely. And we're not going to go back to that. That's done and dusted with. So the, the, the big challenge, I think, is, you know, how many times can you have a coronation, a queen's funeral, <laughs> uh, or Glastonbury? You know, the, these, are, these, are, these are occasional events, and some are very occasional events. Um, so I, I, I think uh, the, the big challenge is how you have a common conversation. Um, uh, you know, and, and here we are in Scotland where, you know, we've, 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 uh, we've been having a sort of pretty cross, diverse conversation, you know, particularly since the independence referendum, you know, that's, that's not changed. There's been Brexit, which has left, you know, major uh, scars, I think, on, on the body politic in the UK. There's been the impact of COVID, which has actually changed the way in which people behave and think, you know, so we've, we, and, and, and then there's the, the kind of economic crisis. Now, all of these things actually shape how we interact with uh, the various kinds of media that we have. And um, all I'm saying is it's complex, no simple solutions, but um, if we want to start thinking about this, we need to take the complexity into account and not kid ourselves. Thank you. Look, just, just before um, I ask you to comment on, on that general principle, I'm thinking about one of the things that I think, um, from a more shocking point of view, the, the nation did actually have a, a communal response to was um, when 
uh, the war in Ukraine started. And we did have an intense coverage of that for a long, long time. But over time, it, it tails off. And, and uh, could you just maybe re explain to us why that happens in the news cycle and what you think um, changes that take something off the news agenda? Um, in, in terms of these big items as they happen. I'm sure Linda's got a view on, on that as well, but I think the, the, the clue sort of in the question, it is a news cycle and, uh, and news is news. There are new things that happen and th there's an element to, to the crisis in Ukraine that has become uh, largely similar each day, very small advancements, very small changes. And it doesn't mean that, that the broadcasters, both ITN and the BBC aren't there, they're still there with the resources that they had, but there's other things happening that are that are moving them off. As, as Philip said, we, we've had a, a a range of moments in our society in the last sort of eight years that that if you were to go back 20 years and look ahead, you wouldn't have believed what what we then had. And I think the news agenda gets really really competitive in terms of the actual shelf space you've got to cover things. And people in Scotland are deeply interested in international matters, so that I think is a very fair question. Uh, and, and there's obviously been a lot of Scottish links with Ukraine in terms of how charities and other organisations have tried to support the Ukrainian effort. So it's then what do you do with that news cycle? How do you bring something different to it to help keep the story going, to help keep it alive in the minds of the audience? Uh, th there is some research that some people don't want to keep hearing grim news. Uh, so how do broadcasters react to that? If people only want good news, and yet the things that are happening are things like the war in Ukraine, there's almost a disconnect between what some people want from their news cycle, and maybe that's one of the reasons they're turning to, to social media for news, but, but it isn't news in terms of what's happening in Ukraine or in Russia or, or elsewhere. It's, it's news about skateboarding cats, and that's what some people are, are calling news. And, and it's, a, it's a really, really tricky cycle and a tricky moment, but, but ultimately I think the cycle just moves on. Other things happen. Okay, th thank you. Um, Stuart, you, as a documentary maker, um, you're maybe not happening at an event that happens in time, if you like. It's a, it's a different, slightly different um, uh, mechanism for you to get your message across. But um, I notice that there's um, other providers are available, but Sky has an advert at the moment, Sky Glass, where you can join a family member if you you have yeah. a camera and have that still a shared experience so um what, what's your experience of how people respond collectively to to the to the um the documentaries that you make and is the does it build a community behind it yes i would i would say so definitely um obviously you have your spaces you have you know your social media your, your facebook your instagram um, actually, I'll give you a, a, st a story there. So the documentary, Black and Scottish, just prior to that coming out, you know, you have your hashtags. So you have hashtag Black and Scottish. So I did a search on Instagram and social media and there was no hashtag Black and Scottish. Now there's thousands. So um, people, mothers and, you know, ethnic minorities, started to share the content and take little snippets. What we did as well, we, we made um, one minute snippets on each subject, let's say, you know, cultures or racism or whatever it may be, love of Scotland. And they did really well. They got over a million. So, so instead of people having a link to the half an hour documentary, we're giving them social media snippets, as I call it that will then take them back to linear television or take them to, to um, BBC iPlayer. So a community can grow, and that's, that's kind of indirectly our new watering hole, in a sense, where you would, um, where you would usually we would channel hop and we would watch um, a show and then the next day we're, we're talking about it. But now that, that narrative lives in the social media space, which is a good and bad thing because, you know, you kind of have to search for it. You know, you have to, you have to search for that if you're interested, interested in it. And when I, talk about, when I talk about spaces, what I'm meaning is we all have a, um, a television show or whatever show on television or a streaming service that you recommend to someone else. 
Whereas before, when we used to channel hop, as we had said, we had BBC One to, to um, Channel Five. We don't do that anymore. Um, and unfortun unfortunately, what we need to do is, from a digital perspective, is go as, as um, Philip was saying, from a digital perspective, it's going nowhere. So we need to try and find a way to have conversations about the content that we've, that, um, we've watched. Where, does that, where, where is that space? Um, do we have a lot more de dedicated spaces on things like Twitter and Instagram? Does BBC Scotland, does, does STV, do we, do we put more money into uh, social media? Um, going forward so we can have those those discussions. That's the only thing um, that I can see, but it is a good thing because the difference back then, when I'm showing my age now, let's say in uh, the 90s, you would tell someone about, uh, you know, tell someone about a, a show, they would then tell someone else. Now you can just put out a hashtag and X amount of thousands or millions of people are looking at it. So there's positive and negatives there. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I yeah, that, absolutely. I think, I think another thing is, you know, uh, Stuart, you spoke there about the documentary Black and Scottish, and I remember when it did first air, it was actually my children, draw my attention oh. to it, my children are Black and Scottish. And oh, right. that, yeah, and, and it was the title, and actually, you, you, what you said there about then searching online and then finding that, that conversation and that identity, and it, it hadn't, it, first of all, it came, I think, from obviously the commissioning from, was it BBC that, yeah. that commissioned it? So, you know, Linear TV, but then, you know, and it came, I think, did it have a resurgence again after George yes, Floyd? Yeah, George Floyd in yeah. 2020, that's when it did, yeah. yeah. And, uh, sorry, we look like we're just having this personal conversation here or not. Or <laughs> the, the pertinent point being that the the idea that you know it is not all lost in young people, right? Television is not all lost, but we do need to be out there on the platforms and the media and the social media that people are using. That conversation has to be had, and it takes different forms. You spoke there about you know breaking up and giving snack sizes of yeah. what you do. We, I mean, we're doing that in in news. I feel like I'm bringing it back to news while I'm head of news. I talk here about about news, and it is about being absolutely relevant with the audience. And I think I, I mentioned the the figure of thirty. Nine percent, which you know I'm hugely proud of because it rates high, but actually you make a very fair point that young people are consuming news on digital, and I see many young people here, and you know I don't need to tell you that. I'm sure you you would be the first to tell me that. So what we have been doing at STV News certainly over the past five years since 2018, big transformation, and you know really accelerated over the past two and a half years is looking at how we move the newsroom from being. You know, a, a, a linear facing I mean, TV newsroom, essentially TV newsroom to multi-platform newsroom. Mm -hmm. None of this is new. All newsrooms are doing it. I see we're not a TV newsroom. We are a multi-platform newsroom. The really simple way of explaining that is reporters will go out to report on one story and that story will be distributed across a number of platforms. So they may make the, the six o'clock news that night. But actually now we need to be looking at, you know, push notifications if the, you know, when the former First Minister spoke um, when she was resigning Nicola Sturgeon, you know, we put that directly to people's phones. It was a press conference held and that was push notification directly to people and they could watch it, the part, they can become part of that conversation. So um, I use these as examples of what we are doing to stay relevant and staying relevant is hugely important. It can't be a one-way conversation, news being produced for people who are watching and we do have a very loyal audience who tend to be older. So the challenge that we have is maintaining your broadcast audience alongside growing and being relevant with the, the audiences that are consuming on all different platforms. And in those breaking news moments, people do come to their public media providers. So we would, we would have had hundreds of thousands of people watching Nicola Sturgeon's resignation statement on television between BBC Scotland and the News Channel. We had over 5 million people access the BBC's news pages that day online to find out the latest, to find out what was happening. So there is a huge hunger amongst the public still to get that news when it's important to them. I think my final point on news, but it's about remaining relevant, and I am, I am so, you know, that that's the bit that now 
I, I take so seriously. That there is no, that we can't just be telling the same stories of yesteryear. We have to really look at our makeup of um, our story selection. We spoke there about news cycle. I agree with all your points, but there is room within that news cycle and agenda to uh, to, to be editorial around. Where do we want to put our emphasis, particularly in current affairs? And that's why we put Scotland tonight into our prime time slot. Um, but part of being relevant is saying, and one of the things that I did is I kind of, you know, it's best to tell this in a story, I suppose, is news has to be impartial, has to be accurate, that's a given. But what about if news had to be 50 50 gender balanced? Now, some people would say that can't happen because you have to report the news that you see in front of you. Well, actually, another way of saying that is maybe it's just too hard. Well, let's try. And in fact, let's not make it negotiable. Let's say that we want our news to be gender balanced. Why? Because it's really important. And as journalists, go out and get beyond always the first people that you see. Revolutionise your contacts book. Find interest in voices. Get into your communities. And that was the challenge that we set. And we... we, we we monitored it. We literally counted our contributors. And last year we met 50-50. And that was, it was a really, really strong achievement. And we also do it with other underrepresented groups that we've set ourselves targets. Not because it's some, you know, some good thing to do. If it's a box ticking exercises, it's not worth the paper it's written on. It's to make the change that is needed and required and to give us much better uh, relevant news and you know that's that that's important to me it's essential the public broadcasters do it the the, the 50 50 thing started with a guy called ros atkins who presented uh, outside source on the bbc news channel and he challenged his own production team because he was fed up of seeing other men on his program when he thought there were amazing women that could be speaking just as uh, brilliantly as the guys his production team was finding. And it spun off from there. And now I think almost all of BBC News and a whole range of other BBC content uh, goes for 50-50. That, because, as you said, not, not tokenistically, it's reflective of the society that we're in. And one of the things we did do was, you know, it, you can set these targets, but you also have to be involved very much in the culture change and making it happen. And how do you go about doing that? And one of the things that we found that there were barriers in people's way. What, what is it about, you know, going on to a programme like Scotland Tonight? Why are there not more women? Well, we can, and I would say an anecdotal, I'd wander over to the production team and say, how are you getting on? Who are you casting tonight? And they've got X, Y, and Z, and oh, you've got no women. Or oh, we've phoned some people, it's been challenging to get them on. Or are they, and, and I said, well, what, what's going on there? You know, what, what is really going on there? And also, you know, how do we ensure that we are growing our contacts? So we ran what's called an Expert Voices programme. And I mean, it's a very practical programme. It's a training programme that STV does. We do it on Zoom. We've had a thousand contributors come along and we reach out to different groups. Um, and we, we run them in the evening and it's people who work in STV. It's run by my colleague, Nicola Kane. And she brings, she ropes in our political editor and she ropes in some of our <coughs> presenters. And they go on and they just talk. They talk to people and they say, look, this is what it's like going on a programme. Here's what you can do. Here's how you can get your message over. Um, so that's the training side of it. Another side of it, I say it's actually training for our journalists. It's actually saying, reach out and look for, look, look, look for new, new people. You know, work with different associations. Uh, look for, speak to people who are in underrepresented groups and ask them what they need and then respond. So that's part of that responsibility that comes from public service broadcasting. You challenge faced by the parliament as well and the work I know, I know our outreach team do a really good job in trying to make our events as inclusive as possible and get to those harder to reach communities that haven't had a voice up until now. So it's really important. I, I'm going to open up to questions. Uh, there's um, one of our staff members will have a, a microphone. Just take this opportunity to thank all the Parliament staff for their efforts today in supporting the event. And also to say a particular thanks to Heather and Mags who have been um, signing for us throughout the event um, and doing a wonderful job. So thank you very much. Um, so I see a hand up here. If you want to say who you are, that would be, be nice. <laughs> you don't have to. And if you want to direct a question to a particular panel <coughs> member, please please do so, but I'll, I'll generally assume that you want to hear from everyone. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Jen Stout. I'm a journalist. I, it's good that we've been talking a lot about news and current affairs. As you say, it's the, it's the cornerstone of public broadcasting, public service broadcasting. 
it's it's also like the one island in the scorched earth of Scottish journalism that is still slightly solvent and there's still decent jobs in it. I mean, when you look at once great Scottish newspapers reduced to so much churn, very few jobs, people mass exodus for, for PR jobs just so that people can pay the rent. We're really in a bad situation. I mean, Luke, you said that, you know, and we hear this a lot, Scotland's a very internationalist country and we're very interested in international news. We don't have any employed foreign correspondents left in broadcast. I mean, there's Quentin who does, of course, UK news. We don't have people employed to tell a Scottish audience what is happening on the ground in a major war in Europe. There's a few freelancers like myself and that's it. So are we really an internationalist country interested in foreign news? I'm, I'm not sure, frankly. And I think what that means is that there's an even greater pressure on news and current affairs within broadcasting in Scotland um, to make up the ground for, what, for what's happened in, in Scottish newspapers. And having worked in, in TV and radio, I'm kind of deeply worried. Um, you talked about skateboarding cats. There's a bit too much of that. There's a way too much focus on the focus groups, on how will that play out on Instagram? How will that work on social media? And there is a, <laughs> what I saw frequently, and this is not to denigrate any of my colleagues, because there's a lot of very, very good people at BBC Scotland, but particularly on my management, perhaps, um, maybe not an appreciation of the importance of old fashioned investigative journalism, particularly at a local level. And that, as we know, is completely decimated on, on newspapers, uh, in terms of newspapers, you know, investigations. Actually, it's one thing to package stuff up that we already know. I mean, it's fine to have a coronation and so on. But the essence of journalism being find out something new and tell people, that takes a long time and it takes a lot of resources. And my worry is that the value of that is being lost, not just in newspapers, but in broadcasting as well. So I wonder if we could talk about that a little bit. Thank mm. you. Thank you. I, I think a huge topic and moving on to, to, to different uh, media as well. Um, and obviously people are choosing not to buy papers as well, which is a, a change in the consumer habit as well around all of that. But um, I'll, let, I'll, I'll come to Luke first um, uh, if you want to respond. I think the point around the number of journalism jobs in Scotland is, is well made. Uh, and, and in many ways it's frightening. And without, without STV and the BBC investing in journalism, I, I sort of shudder to think what, what would be left, not, not just newspapers either. I think I mentioned before my background was in commercial radio, on air in Aberdeen and, and in Edinburgh, and then behind the scenes in both of those cities. And when I was running Radio Forth here in Edinburgh, there were, I think, 40 to 50 people who had freelance and staff jobs on air doing journalism, doing sport and doing presentation. Now there's a couple of journalists, roughly, and about five people working on air. The number of jobs has, has markedly shrunk. So uh, th there's almost a, a sort of double pressure, I think, on the public broadcasters to get it right. Investigative journalism is really important to BBC Scotland. Our strand is Disclosure, uh, led by the, the, the fabulous Shelley Joffrey. Uh, and I think it has generated a, a huge amount of public debate. You often see Disclosure referenced here in this parliament, actually when it unearths, as you said, finding new things, unearths stuff that, that's happening in and around Scotland and telling the stories that, that nobody else might be telling, partly because it's expensive and partly because there's literally nobody else to do it. So I think the investigative stuff is, is vital uh, and there's a new series of disclosure coming fairly soon. Uh, on that other point around international, I, I think people in Scotland are genuinely interested in international affairs. I think you can see that in, in, the, in the content that's provided. Uh, I think we do a reasonable job at BBC Scotland of doing that, partly because we can tap in to a network of foreign correspondents all around the world who are on the BBC's payroll. Uh, nice you mentioned Quentin. I, I was at school at Stirling High School with Quentin, and it just is heart-stopping seeing some of the situations that he, that he finds himself in. But, but a great Scottish journalist doing amazing things from war zones and famine and people struck by, by poverty. But when someone like, for example, Orla Gearan is on either The Nine or on Good Morning Scotland, what she's got to say and share with the Scottish audience is, is I know, highly valued, and I value her expertise being part of, of the BBC. Martin Geisler, as a, as, a, as a presenter based here, has that international experience that he's brought back to Scotland. So I, I take your challenge. When, when The Nine launched, the, there was a Europe correspondent, but she has moved on to, to do other things. Uh, and I think she was the first 
uh, television correspondent working abroad for any of the Scottish news providers, television news providers, in many, many years. That, that was, uh, it was Jean McKenzie, uh, although she is now the, I think, South Korea correspondent for the BBC. And a number of other Scottish journalists, Laura Bicker, for example, ha have gone off to work abroad. Scottish Voice is doing great things, but working for the whole of our organisation. Can I add, um, you mentioned um, Disclosure Scotland and I totally forgot that um, we made a piece for Disclosure Scotland, um, Shelley, we worked with Shelley and one was um, a Scotland racist and um, that was, uh, my, my cousin is Jeannie Hansen, she's a television presenter for A Place in the Sun um, and some Channel 4. I should actually know all the shows she's in, but anyway, she, she was the face of it. And then we had a young journalist who's in the room who I worked with, Donald, Donald Matheson. He worked in that. He actually produced that, 22 years old. He produced a uh, half an hour piece for Disclosure Scotland. And then there was, we, we made small pieces of content, which is one he'd made, which was, which was Am I Scottish? Now, that was, we, that was current affairs. We, had a great time making it. It was, it was a fast, for me as a documentary maker, um, I was directing it, but it was a faster pace. The content had to come out a lot quicker. And I actually, I was, I'm so used to it taking my time and you know, but with working with Shelley and her team, what they taught me at the time was how to produce content quickly. Now, from what, what, you, what you were saying, um, in the sense of it takes a larger team, it costs a lot more money. I personally think that a lot more money should be put into that because I think what Disclosure, what, what um, that channel, what that show is doing is it's providing investigative journalism, but maybe we need to put a little bit more money on it so we can churn that out a lot quicker. And those smaller pieces that, that were made, those 10 minute pieces, they then went on to BBC iPlayer and social, and social media. So we do need a lot more money behind things like um, the disclosure. Well, disclosure, yeah. Philip, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, well, I'd agree with the analysis. I, <clears throat> I think you're right that there's been a major decline in the Scottish press. Um, it's really interesting to reflect on the Scottish press pre-devolution and post-devolution. Um, <clears throat> there really was, um, I think, uh, there were great expectations about devolution and what this would do for the printed media, which simply didn't come about. And what we've seen over time is disinvestment and at the same time, um, if you like, more competition from the London-based UK press, uh, kind of crowding out effects in terms of the quality that's offered. And um, I think that that is a serious question, if you like, for <coughs> Scotland's democracy within the UK. Um, whether Scotland um, you know, can have uh, distinct perspectives on the world, the inter international affairs, I think, is a moot point. Uh, I, I think some people would be saying, well, that's not Scotland's place, but I don't think that's a good enough answer. Um, investigative journalism is expensive. <clears throat> the only way you get it is really to have sustained investment. Um, and I think the story that we've been hearing is that we're getting the reverse of that, actually. So I, I, I'm afraid there's not much good news in this, particular, <laughs> in this particular story. I don't think it's going to get better. I think there will be, of course, occasional uh, flashes of brilliance and uh, you know, occasional sustainable excellence. But that's the exception uh, rather than the rule. And I, I think uh, digitalization of the press, of course, has been a big factor in addition to disinvestment in Scotland. And in the UK, you know, at best, 9% of people will pay for news, actually. So uh, it's, it, it's not going to come from us, if you like, digitally. People will not buy digital news, actually. They just won't. Um, and it's, 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 um, it's not that unusual, but there are places where the record is a great deal better. So I think 
The question is complicated. It's partly about journalism itself. It's partly about our willingness to pay and our willingness to recognize that certain kinds of journalism are actually important for us. And I'll just leave it on that note because I have nothing uh, very helpful to say to you, I'm afraid. <laughs> Some of the around um, certain um, degree courses, particularly down in England, about whether or not they should be investing in them and, and things like that. And um, we still have some some really very very good journalism courses and and training uh, in Scotland. So, do you want to to maybe reflect a wee bit on that and your your thoughts on the question as well? I, I would say first and foremost, it is. Uh, disheartening to hear about the closure in, of, of newspapers and opportunities for journalists. I think that's, you know, I think that it's a hard message. Um, we as a broadcaster are investing in news and we've actually taken on more journalists in recent times. So, uh, but, you know, I, 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 you, you don't need, you know, comfort words, but I, I do feel having set out my career, wanting to be into broadcasting and getting that opportunity and getting in the door that, um, I would want to see more opportunities for young people coming in. We do take on a number of young journalists um, and they do often come from some of the training uh, uh, university degrees, particularly some of the postgraduate degrees. Um, I, don't have the, I don't have the answer to this. I, I've got a couple of thoughts on it. Uh, I always say to young people setting out, you know, you bring yourself to journalism. Yes, you have to be impartial. Yes, you have to be accurate. That's a given but you bring yourself into your work. And the more experiences that you can have and that you can develop in yourself, I am sure will make you a better journalist. So don't be afraid to not do a journalism degree. Don't be afraid not to do a degree, but if you want to go and do a degree, do something that you love, do something that you enjoy. You will have, you know, I would hope a great time at university. It's a time in your life, often in your early twenties, where you grow and develop and you get, gather your thoughts and then you can come into journalism. I, I found personally some of the postgraduate degrees very good. Cardiff has been excellent. Caledonia University has provided journalists in. Um, all of that said, I am a great believer in diversity, in diversity at all levels, and diversity of thought and diversity of roots in. You know, and I, I came up a big, big, uh, you know, number ten of eleven children, big working class uh, family. But I came to journalism because I had lots to say and lots to write about. I had a great, you know, had a great, uh, a, a great family to write about and a, a great community to comment on. And that's how I, I, I wanted to get into journalism. But I am keen that we have uh, a, a, at the interview stage and at a stage where we're bringing people in. How can we get beyond the same type of people coming into journalism? And I think we do a very good job of that at STV and I'm determined that we will do more. So I don't want to get drawn on specifics or specific courses. I would say that the people that we have got within our team who have done some of those courses are excellent journalists. Um, I saw some hands up. There was a, uh, a, I'll take the gentleman here in the glasses and then I'll go to the back of the room. Um, I'd be interested in the panellists' views on what I perceive as the decline of trust in mainstream news, particularly, and people using Facebook or whatever and almost giving it more credence than mainstream news. So comments about that and what you think you might be able to do about it. <laughs> Does anyone, <laughs> anyone want to go first with that, Stuart? <laughs> That is not that is not my space. I think what you're saying. I think what you're saying is, you know, um, you've got mainstream news, and then you've got your social media. You've got your okay. So what they'll tend to do is they'll tend to go into more depth. So uh, on social media, on places like like Facebook, and then you've got your small little snippets on um, news. But the way I look at it is, I would rather hear from yourself. I would rather hear straight from the source rather than a reporter or journalist telling me that story. If I can go straight to the source on social, on social media um, and in that space I hear all of the com like what I tend to do is I'll sometimes just go in and read the comments because to me the, the comment section is 
the the gallery where everyone you know that's that that's where the gallery is so in a sense of trust from from uh, trust for the the main uh, public sector and, and and news i think that trust is diminished when they get something wrong when they get something wrong and they feel like i don't trust that last story so why should i continue to trust um this this channel so that's my take on it. Wouldn't you rather speak? To, wouldn't you rather speak to the source or or people close to it? Speak to a, a read up of what? Sorry, what I'm trying to say is read up on what another human being is saying rather than a corp, rather than a news corporation. I would prefer the former. I don't know about you, you lot. I think the public broadcasters obviously are in a, a very different place from a, a lot of social media in that that we are regulated. Uh, and, and I know that Ofcom are, are in the room today and, and both Channel 4, Channel 5, STV and the BBC ha have, have literal rules that they have to operate within in terms of how they tell stories, how they do journalism in a way that somebody on Facebook or somebody on Twitter d doesn't have to do. So you think, well, well, surely that would mean then that these public broadcasters are, are more trusted because they have the rules. And yet, a lot of the algorithms on social media now will, once it's worked out that you're particularly interested in one thing, and particularly in politics from a particular angle, it'll just serve you more of that thing. So if you, for example, if you're an SNP MSP, and you follow lots of other SNP politicians, councillors, branch members, it's going to serve you more and more and more of that. Uh, so you see the world through through one particular prism it, on your social media. It serves you more and more of that thing. And then you maybe turn on STV News or The Nine or Reporting Scotland, and you see that perspective, but you see a completely different perspective as well. And you think, well, why are they saying that when everybody thinks it's this? Because everybody on your social media is coming from a similar part of the algorithm. So th that is partly undermining trust because people are being exposed to things that are not regulated in the same way that, that broadcast media is. And I, th I think that is a, is a real challenge. Th then there's the, the, the sort of bad actors out there. There are people who are deliberately undermining trusted sources of news. And don't get me wrong, nine out of 10 people come to the BBC every week in Scotland for, for all sorts of things. And the BBC is now the most trusted news brand in the United States of America. And, and that maybe says more about what's happened to the media in the United States of America <laughs> that, that, than, it, than it says about anything else. But the, the, you know, the, the public media, the traditional media brands are still trusted. But, but even this past week, there's been a, a considerable amount of fake news about the BBC. Uh, two days ago, there was an allegation the BBC had photoshopped a picture of Nicola Sturgeon outside an airport departure lounge, except it wasn't photoshopped. It was an image that had been acquired from Getty Images, and Nicola Sturgeon had been photographed at Edinburgh Airport in 2015. The photograph was genuine. There's a whole load of stuff kicking around on social media at the moment saying that the BBC is not covering the UCI World Cycling Championships, which, which Claire mentioned earlier. The, the BBC is the host of the European Broadcasting Union at the moment. The, the, their centre is in Pacific Quay. It was on television on the BBC for eight hours on Sunday. And it's on television today, it's on television this weekend, and it's on uh, a, a whole load of iPlayer platforms, and it's been leading a lot of our sports bulletins. And yet, to follow some people online, that, and, and if you followed the people online who were saying it, you'd think, oh, the BBC doesn't care about Scotland, they're not showing the cycling. Except they are, to, to hours and hours and hours of content. Uh, and there, there was a deep fake video of Fiona Bruce circulating on uh, Tuesday, and in the end we did manage to get Facebook slash Meta to take it down, but it appeared to show Fiona Bruce encouraging people to invest in an AI company. She was effectively the, the, the brand ambassador for some product she'd A, never heard of, and B, never spoken about. But it was deeply convincing. And, and not only, of course, is, is that a, a, a total problem for us, we don't allow our journalists to do that. It undermines your trust in her if you think, oh, Fiona Bruce has been bought by an AI company. So th there are lots of threats to the traditional media platforms out there at the moment. It's a, it's a great question. Uh, but, but I think when you look at a really polarized media market like the United States, it's those traditional media providers that are still winning the, the trust battle. Um. Yes, Philip, you know. what a nice, easy question. Uh, you've uh, loved us. Um, I, I think the, I mean, what is trust about? I mean, trust is really about uh, believing in what you're told. And it's also connected to your experience of having evidence which supports that belief. In other words, 
uh, you, you have to be you have to be inclined to uh, I think filter things a bit um, weigh things up and also have some sort of faith in the institutions which are develop, delivering content to you and and that's the you know we are in a crisis about that so I think your question really starts to unpack something which is much much uh, wider uh, one of the points made uh, this morning is that there is new news avoidance going on. Around the, the, in a big study, a big international study done by the Reuters Institute, it's around 30% of people in media markets across the world are actually avoiding news because uh, it could be, you know, it's just too much to take and it's also because sources are not trusted. Um, the decline of trust in mainstream news, I think, you do need to unpack that a bit. I, I think it is true, at least on the evidence I've seen, that the BBC and other public service broadcasters are more trusted than other sources, actually. So there is actually, in the UK, quite low trust in what comes out of the printed press, uh, despite the fact that people still consume it. Um, so, uh, lack of trust also goes with um, suspicion of sources and, uh, in some respects, allowing um, what you consume to confirm what you believe. And, of course, that's where uh, the kind of fragmentation that's been going on and the way in which algorithms may indeed reinforce, reinforce beliefs uh, has become really important in a way that was not the case, say, 10 or 15 years ago. Um, I think trust in the news is also highly connected to trust in politics, uh, to the honesty of public officials, and the extent to which they can influence what is said about them, and also the interests of the owners of media and the extent to which they can skew the interests of their reporting. So I, I think it's, you, you've really touched on something that's extremely complicated. Um, why are people mistrustful of the press, for example? Well, you may recall uh, that a few years ago there was a big inquiry um, chaired by Lord Leveson which looked into phone hacking and, and uh, the intrusion into people's private messages. Uh, which is a very big issue right now uh, when you look at the way in which government is actually proposing to uh, lawfully hack into uh, many messages that we are um, actually producing. Um, what's the, what, what can we do about it? Uh, well, one of the long-standing arguments is that <clears throat> we need to improve uh, what's called the media literacy of the public. In other words, we need to understand what different media do, we need to understand the landscape that's changing, all the sorts of things that have been discussed now. Um, it is uh, conceivably you know, something that should be part of education uh, at every level. Um, we do need to understand what evidence is and what hearsay is and what false uh, accounts are. And um, you know, we're also in a, in, a, in, a, in a situation where there's tremendous anxiety, if you like, about bad actors hacking into systems. Um, for the, 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 the kind of the best example of that, but there have, of course, been others, was, of course, the, the role of Russian trolling during the presidential campaign in the USA in 2016. And, uh, the data breaches that we've just experienced here in the UK, um, <clears throat> reported on um, by the, the laxity of the Electoral Commission, it seems, um, you know, have opened that box up as well. So um, your question, in a way, encapsulates everything that makes us anxious <laughs> and to which we really don't have very good answers, but I think we have to try. And we have to try um, in ways that you know are quite demanding, which is you know to have respect for diversity of view, but not to uh, not to uh, 
have such respect for diversity of view that blatant lies will be accepted in the public domain. So I'll leave it there. It's a long one, that one. So. <laughs> <laughs> I did, and it, it squeezed us in terms of uh, any more questions, I'm afraid. But uh, Linda, you get the final word. I get the final yeah. word. I was actually going to give you the final I was going to ask, actually, the questioner for their view on, on that particular point. Do you want to have the final word, questioner? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, putting you, maybe putting you in the spot there. Um, I, I mean, I think there is a decline of trust in, in, in public broadcasting. I think it is due to social media. I find it quite alarming that people I think of as very sensible friends of mine will say, did you see such and such on social media? It said, you know, an absolute load of nonsense. But increasingly, I do feel that the coverage it gets, it somehow is leading to people to question much more the mainstream. Now, some of that's good. I think that that's great. But um, yeah, a lot of it, I think, is potentially dangerous as well. OK, so okay. I think I could bring that back together. I'm not sure you're a fan of the social media, but I think you may be interested. You're heavily, I'm, I'm sure I know that you are heavily involved in politics and current affairs and engaged. Um, I think this has been a great discussion. We've covered so much ground. We've spoke about the challenges of a public service media at the moment, for the need to grow the creative industries, for the broadcasters in Scotland to play their part, for the audiences to play their part, to tell us where they are viewing and wanting to have their news and their programmes delivered to. But it opens up a whole new landscape for us to work within. And I think that there are are so many areas that we can work together on, but I think very good discussion today. So I am absolutely out of time. Apologies to those that I didn't take, particularly I think your, your colleague that you mentioned earlier, Stuart, who wanted to ask a question. Maybe we can have a, a, a chat afterwards. Um, but thank you all for um, contributing and, and being interested in, in today's event. It's been absolutely wonderful. Um, can you please show your appreciation to Stuart Chesamire, Linda, Graham Douglas, Luke McCulloch, and Professor Philip Schlesinger. Again, thank you to um, our signers and the staff who have supported today and to the University of Glasgow who have, have enabled this event to take, part, uh, take place today. I um, can also remind everyone to do please give us some feedback through the event vibe forms or from the, the forms that have been issued downstairs today. Um, uh, it's something that we, we, we love the Festival of Politics and we want to make it as uh, interesting for you as it possibly can be. So please give us your feedback on that. And an opportunity to remind you that there's lots more happening today. We have Michael Portillo later uh, uh, this afternoon. And uh, I, I'm posting again, um, chairing the Future of Scotland's Arts and Culture at 5pm. And tomorrow, um, panels on migration, ethics and artificial intelligence. Something I did want to go on to, but there wasn't time today. And um, the future of Scottish music venues. So, so lots going on in the cultural sphere in Scotland. And again, thank you all. I hope you have a wonderful day at the Parliament. Thank you.